friends of St. Peter's and thank you for joining us. I hope you made it in time for that beautiful, beautiful prelude on this Bluegrass Sunday. I think the first time I heard All Fly Away, I was probably nine years old. Uh, it's a down home guitar. There was a concert at Down Home Guitar in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, there was a band there playing. And I remember hearing that beautiful, beautiful hymn. And thank you so much to Abigail, Adrian, and Joey uh, for offering us beautiful music um, on this Bluegrass Weekend. We're also excited that we have Anne and Olivia here to be our readers. It's always wonderful hearing voices speaking together in this age of, um, of Zoom worship. So thank you for joining us as lectors today. Our service begins in our bulletin, which you'll find uh, posted uh, in, the, uh, in the comments and hopefully in the introduction to this video, both on YouTube and on Facebook. And we begin with the opening acclamation, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll say the great and wonderful, great and wonderful are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O sovereign of the nations. Who shall not revere and praise your name, O Lord, for you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship in your presence, for your just dealings have been revealed. To the one who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor, glory and might, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with, well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at the distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. 
while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it in. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in reading the psalm responsibly by whole verse. If the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say. If the Lord had not been on our side when enemies rose up against us, then would they have swallowed us up alive in their fierce anger towards us? Then would the waters have overwhelmed us and the torrent gone over us? Then would the raging waters have gone right over us? Blessed be the Lord. He has not given us over to be a prey for their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in the proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. I pray that God's word is spoken and that God's word is heard. Amen. Well, we have some amazing, amazing readings today, and it's really hard to know where to start. So I think I'll start somewhat at the beginning with the five bold women. This passage from Exodus is absolutely incredible. And um, it comes to us 
uh, not the very beginning of the book of Exodus. Uh, the very beginning of the book of Exodus has a genealogy, which is why um, uh, in Hebrew, it's often referred to as the book of names because it starts, these are the names of the descendants. Um, and so I think it's interesting to pay attention to who is named in this passage that Anne just read for us and who is not. So we have this story of five bold women and women um, very rarely get a lot of stories in the Bible, frankly, and even then are often not named. So um, it's amazing to see who gets a name in this story, starting with the two Hebrew midwives. Now, um, Shipra and Pua are barren slaves, Hebrews, in this horribly oppressive situation that uh, the passage describes. We have um, uh, a king of Egypt who no longer remembers Joseph, which is kind of hard to imagine given how uh, Genesis ended with Joseph uh, being in control of Pharaoh's whole world, practically. Um, and the Hebrew people have finally been fruitful and multiplied uh, as they've been commanded throughout Genesis, uh, chapter 1, chapter 8, chapter 35, over and over, be fruitful and multiply. Well, they finally are fruitful and multiply, but they're in Egypt and not in the promised land. So um, time for a story, right? We got to get them back to the promised land. And so we find ourselves in Exodus and we find the Egyptians afraid because uh, they are being fruitful uh, and multiplying. And um, so we hear this story of oppression and we hear how um, the king of Egypt, did you catch that? At first he's not called Pharaoh. He doesn't even get a name. We don't know which Pharaoh this is. And calling him the king of Egypt is rather like calling the Pope the Bishop of Rome. Uh, it's something of an insult not to use his real title. It also serves to make um, this Pharaoh really a stand in for every king, for every monarch, for every um, example of um, deadly, extreme human power and oppressive power. And um, given the trouble that Israelites get with their own kings, it's kind of foreshadowing that. But we have the king of Egypt here um, creating a situation where um, he's trying to weaken the strong Hebrew people. And these amazing, amazing midwives, Shifra and Pua, uh, stand up to him. Like, no one stands up to Pharaoh, but they do. And their names are beautiful. Uh, Shifra means beauty, and Pua is a murmur or a gurgle, kind of like a baby would make. So you have a really charming, uh, beautiful image, even in their names, as they are called before Pharaoh and, um, and sort of use his racism against him. Um, the language that they use to describe the Hebrew women um, basically plays into uh, all of Pharaoh's fears. Uh, the word uh, vigorous comes from the same root as wild animal, um, can mean brutish, brutish, um, and it is only uh, found in the Hebrew scriptures right here, right in this passage. So they rather use Pharaoh's um, racist assumptions against him in outwitting him. Oh yeah, they're so strong, they don't even need us midwives. They've already given birth by the time we get there. In this book that's all about deliverance, is all about liberation, Shifra and Pua are the first liberators. They're the first deliverers. These women who are at the bottom of the power structure, women, barren, midwife, slaves, compared to Pharaoh. There is almost no way to overestimate the power differential between them. And it's it's a wonderful reminder that no matter how powerful uh, the, the human power may be in this monarch or that king or that pharaoh or that institution or the other, no human power is greater than the power of God and God's love. And they truly, these two midwives, um, begin this story by showing how um, we can live into that passage from Romans, offering the, their whole selves as a living sacrifice. They're, whole, they're very living, not being conformed to the world, 
standing up against the system and allowing God's dream to unfold. But it doesn't stop there. We also have the story of Moses's mother and his sister, who might be Miriam, but neither of them are named. And we hear Moses's mother um, giving birth to this son and seeing that he is a very fine boy. And that word, more fun with Hebrew, um, really means very good. Uh, and if you think back to Genesis, when God creates creation and says it is good, good, very, very good, that's the same word. So she is really speaking new creation into this story as well. And she holds on to her son for three months and then releases him um, in the basket into the Nile. And Moses' sister follows along just to see what's going to happen. And Pharaoh's daughter finds him in the bulrushes and draws him out. And I love how Miriam, or Moses' sister, pulls this off. She's like, hey, you know, I bet I know someone who can nurse him. How incredibly clever. And so indeed, not only is Moses saved, he is um, at his, in his young life, still raised by his mother and in his family. Um, and in the end, these five bold women, including Pharaoh's very own daughter, very own daughter, work together by offering themselves and their very living to God's dream. And Pharaoh will be undone. Pharaoh will be undone because of these five bold women who indeed aren't conformed to the world, who, who stand up against power, stand up against the system and allow God's dream to unfold. It's such an incredible story. And I'm grateful that we got to hear this passage from Romans 12 today, um, as Paul exhorts uh, the churches in Rome and exhorts all of us to, to offer our entire selves. The, the word uh, somata means body, but in its use, um, really is about our whole self, our whole living, our very life to be offered as a living sacrifice, which is something of an oxymoron. Um, and, um, and he's truly calling us uh, into allowing God to be present uh, in, our, in our very being, through our very living. And um, this language around this being our spiritual worship there's so much translation stuff. I had so much fun this week in preparing, as you can tell. Um, the, the word that they're using for spiritual worship does not derive from spirit, um, neoma. It derives from logos. It almost might be better to say your logical worship, your appropriate worship, the most apt and fitting worship you could do uh, would be to offer your whole self uh, in this way and to allow yourself to be transformed by doing so. Um, and... And this, this passage, this passage exhorting us to live in this way is um, really the explanation point, uh, ex expl explanation point and exclamation point to all that Paul has been saying over these last 11 chapters. Um, what is the, the problem we face as humans is our sin. What is the, um, the answer? God's love and grace through Jesus. God's love and grace from which nothing can separate us. And this is really the so what? So, so live, live fully, live fully in God uh, and bring about God's dream using whatever unique gifts God has given you. Um, uh, the uh, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry uh, in ministering, teacher in teaching, exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness in cheerfulness. Such beautiful, beautiful encouragement. And it ties together beautifully as we hear the gospel this morning and really answers the question that Jesus asks his disciples and asks us, um, who do you say that I am? I promise there's even more fun with translation about that very sentence in just a moment. The setting. We're in Caesarea Philippi. We are in um, a city that has, over the years, been used to celebrate a variety of deity. There's a, a whole temple to, to Pan, the god of all kinds of uh, merriment, shall we say. Um, and and uh, no doubt, um, Jesus asking the disciples these questions in this context 
uh, was not an accident. Um, they're surrounded by uh, images of other kinds of gods. And the language Jesus is using here, um, again, in Greek, um, is much more of an ongoing action. It is more like he's asking them, so who are people saying that I am? Who are you saying that I am? Um, he's actually not asking for uh, a confession, though Peter gives him one. Um, he's asking about an ongoing reality. Who are you saying that I am? And we've already heard uh, in the recent passages them declaring him to be the son of God. And now Peter makes this confession, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And um, then we hear these very familiar images and ideas of, of Peter being the rock upon which the church is built and the, the forces of Hades will not prevail against it and, um, and giving the keys to the kingdom, which no doubt invokes the image of Peter at the pearly gates, you know, looking at the roster to see uh, if someone is to be let in or not. Um, and those are fond images, especially in cartoons, but theologically is not so much of what's happening here. Um, Peter is not um, so much being given the roster that tells who is allowed in and who must stay out. The kingdom of God in Matthew is an unfolding reality, an ever unfolding reality. And he is expecting his disciples to do what he has been doing, healing, feeding, loving, forgiving, reconciling. And so when Jesus is saying, you, the church, have the keys to the kingdom, what I hear is a call for all of us to, with those keys, let loose the grace, the mercy, the forgiveness, the love, the healing that Jesus has offered us and that God dreams can, can just overtake the world. Healing, love, grace, mercy, forgiveness. And the powers of Hades, the very powers of death, will not overcome God's dream. So who are we saying Jesus is by how we are living? Are we making our lives living sacrifices by offering our unique gifts to God's dream? Because this is our, our fitting worship, our appropriate worship, the logical outcome of the good news, the good news of Jesus, that, that we are forgiven, that we are loved, and nothing in the world can separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing we can do to change that God loves us. There's nothing that the world can do to take away that love. And we have been given the keys of the kingdom, the power to unleash that grace and mercy and love and forgiveness upon this world that God loves so much. So, who are we saying Jesus is by our living? Are we living in love and grace and mercy and forgiveness? Are we offering healing to others? Are we accepting that grace, mercy, and love for ourselves? Who are we saying Jesus is? Amen. Let us recite together the Nicene Creed, the foundation of our Christian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us lift our voices in prayer, joining with the faithful throughout the world who offer their intercessions this day, responding, Lord, hear our prayer. Give your grace to those who care for children in foster homes. Sustain them with patience and encourage them to provide a family of love and respect. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Open our eyes to behold your hand in the work of creation, that we may marvel at your intricate craft craftsmanship and tend the beauty that we behold. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Pour your knowledge into the minds of those who are returning to school in the next few weeks, and for those attending for the first time, still, still in their hearts by your loving presence. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant us the grace to honor the many gifts that you have given, not coveting what our neighbor has received, but grateful for what you have entrusted to our care. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself to every nation and people, that we may know you to be the Christ, the Messiah, the one who saves our souls from the pit of darkness, and who comes carrying the, lamps of, the lamp of charity that leads us to the divine life. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Give life to those in the tomb, opening the gates of heaven to all who desire eternal life. Let us pray. Lord, hear our prayer. O oh, most mighty and merciful God, in this time of great sickness, we flee to you for relief and comfort. Deliver us, we beseech you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use for their cure. Comfort those who mourn or who are in great financial distress. And do our leaders with wisdom and courage and grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts to that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And, and also, also with you. you. And I apologize for not mentioning earlier an invitation to add to our um, comments in Facebook or YouTube your birthday and anniversary prayers, but we invite you to do so now. Happy birthday to Sue Anderson. Uh, this is her birthday today, and we're so excited. And her sister's birthday is, was this week as well. But Sue, happy birthday. And to any others, birthdays or anniversaries we have together to celebrate, let us raise our voices and hearts together. Watch over thy servants, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of their lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we come to our offertory, again, my deep thanks to all of you for being so generous, so very generous with your offerings. You're welcome to give via text to give 
at 858-252-0622, or you can give online at stpetersdelmar.net slash give, where you can make a one-time gift or set up an ongoing pledge. You can also send a check through the mail to P.O. Box 336, Delmar, California, 92014. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. And even as we make these offerings, we are reminded, all things come of thee, O Lord. And of thy own we have given thee. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we'll pray the general thanksgiving together. God, our creator, our center, our friend. We thank you for our good life, for those who are dear to us, for our dead and for all who have helped and influenced us. We thank you for the measure of freedom we have and the extent to which we control our lives. And most of all, we thank you for the faith that is in us, for our awareness of you and our hope in you. Keep us, we pray you, thankful, and hopeful and useful until our lives shall end. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you on this day and always. Amen. Amen. Well, we do have a few announcements. Um, if you want to tune in to the 9 or the 11, you'll get even more bluegrass this morning. So I encourage you to do so, even if you aren't able to, um, in the moment, to uh, come back later on Facebook or on YouTube and take it in. Uh, the uh, forum this weekend at 10 o'clock is going to be an update on the sacred ground groups. And we'll be hearing from some of the people who are participating in the sacred circles. Um, so I hope you can join us to hear more from them about that. On September 13th, we have our kickoff Sunday. And I'm really excited about this because while it will not have the carnival and the hot dogs and the ice cream uh, that it often would, uh, we will still have a chance to come together, to um, be somewhat celebratory, and also to do some good in the world in Jesus' name. So September 13th at 2 in the afternoon, we're going to have a drive through event at St. Peter's. We will have a backpack blessing, so bring your backpacks. A device dedication, so if you've been watching worship on your iPad or your phone or your laptop, bring your device with you and we will have a dedication of your, uh, your device for the worship purpose. Uh, we will be handing out some goodies for, um, uh, for Sunday school as well. Um, music for those who are in choir and um, also have a chance to do some good in the world. We are going to be doing an in-gathering, um, some books that have been requested for uh, Refugee Net and also we're working on the details, but our intention is to have an in-gathering that will help those who are struggling with um, distance learning, uh, for school by providing either devices or higher quality internet. And we're working with um, some school districts and some of the community colleges and even Time Warner, um, et cetera, on how best to make that happen for those who are in need, particularly um, families who uh, don't have the resources to have that many people online with their current bandwidth, how we can help them do that. So more information to come. But I hope you'll join us September 13th at 2. Um, and it'll be just great to see you even if you are still in your car. And I have to wave at you from six feet away and, and bless your backpack and your iPad. Uh, I look forward to it. But I also look forward to us together doing something in God's name um, to make a difference in this world. So truly uh, by our very living in our own unique ways. So I look forward to seeing you there. There will also be 
an even song, um, a joint even song we're doing with St. Bart's uh, later that day. So it promises to be a very exciting day. Um, as we think about starting up, um, one of the things that we'll be starting up very soon is education for ministry. And I'm so glad that we have Ann Iverson Peltier here to talk to you a little bit about education for ministry this fall. Ann? Hi. Um, I am one of the mentors of St. Peter's um, Education for Ministry group. I do that along with my father, Pete Iverson. And for those who, who are unfamiliar with it, um, just very briefly, it is a four-year program that you take just one year at a time. It is a mixture of a self-study uh, that takes you through the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, in the third year through church history and in the fourth year through theology and philosophy. Um, but I think the part that I loved the most, I was think was looking forward to the scholarly part when I took it, but the part that I loved the most was the, the community that developed. And even though we are on Zoom right now, um, it's, it's still been a remarkable community. And in that time together, we work through theological reflections where we talk about what we believe and how that applies to our ministry. And it's a, it's a really marvelous program. I know we have many, many people at St. Peter's who have done it. Um, were we doing this in church? Paige might ask people to stand up um, and you'd be surprised. But um, we have four spots in our class um, of 12 still available this fall. And my dad and I would love it if you um, let Paige know you were interested. We'd love to speak um, uh, to you about it more. It's a, it's a wonderful experience. Thank you so much, Anne. And you can email me at pblair at stpetersdelmar.net and I will get you in touch with, with Anne or with Pete so you can find out more or even better yet, register. So hope that you'll pray about that. And another opportunity to come together during this time of such isolation, um, to be in community with other, others from St. Peter's is just a really great opportunity. Along those lines, Helping Hands and the Thrift Shop um, are other opportunities to come together in community and make a difference. And both could use some volunteers who are under 65. So opportunities to serve, I hope you're praying about that um, as a possibility. Please let me know if you're interested either in um, helping out at the thrift shop or helping hands and I will get you in touch with those ministry leaders. I believe there's still an announcement in the bulletin too with that contact information and a hyperlink if you open it online to those email addresses. Am I forgetting any other announcements, Deacon Bob? Nope. Well then will you dismiss us please? Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. God.